Hello, welcome. Tonight we are going to be talking about the politics, ecology, and future of seeds. We're really excited to have all of you tonight. If, you've, if this is your first time, we're going to go through some announcements before we launch in to the rest of the talk. So first, we'd like to thank all of our sponsors, which is growing. <laughs> it's a growing list. Um, the School of Environment and Sustainability, Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Center for Latin American Studies and Caribbean Studies, Center for Engaged Academic Learning, the Center for the Education of Women, and the Francis and Sydney Lewis Visiting Leaders Fund, Seed Wayne and Wayne State University, and the Urban and Regional Planning Program of Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. Thank you for all of our sponsors. We couldn't do it without them. For anyone in the room that is a community member, an unenrolled student, uh, or not an unenrolled student, um, please RSVP in the future if you're coming. We like to get a sense of who's in the room, so we ask you a few questions, and that's on our website. Um, if you just Google Food Literacy for All, it'll come up. And we're really excited, this is the first time that community members, um, along with all the students, are gonna be able to answer all of our questions using our clickers. So, <laughs> if you have your clickers, the way to get it ready and synced up is to hold down the power button until it blinks, and then push AA. Does anybody else need one? We want everyone to participate. <laughs> Keep holding your hand up or when she comes around. And these are not for you to keep as much as I'm sure you're really excited to take these home. They won't do anything at home. They're not a remote control. Um, we will be taking them back at the end of the night, but if you come in the future, you'll get another one. <laughs> so we're going to test this out. So first question of the night. What kind of seed is pictured here? Is it a corn seed, tomato, kale, cherry, or lettuce seed? Oh, interesting. So most of you maybe have poor eyesight. <laughs> Although when I looked on it on my computer, I also thought corn. No, it's not corn, it's tomatoes. So 40% of you, 39% were correct. So hold on to your clickers. We'll have more questions throughout the rest of the night. For students in the class, one reminder is that your first essay is due at noon on February 19th. If community community members want to write an essay, you're welcome to. <laughs> um, it's one to two pages, single space, 10 to 12 point font. You're only going to do three essays throughout the semester, so it's really important that you do these because they're each worth 12 points. And the idea is that you just look back at the four past speakers or panel, pick one, and then answer some questions about how they helped you think through this idea of what it means to plant seeds of resistance to foster a just and sustainable food system. What is the major problem or opportunity that the speaker addressed? How does the problem manifest in the current food system? What opportunities for change were identified? And please mention or cite the principles or evidence from the articles that you also are required to read, and you're welcome to cite other sources as well. We also have an exciting announcement about internships for this summer at the Campus Farm. Haley, stand up and turn around. Haley works at the Campus Farm and she's gonna be here and standing at the back of the room after class if, any, if anybody's interested in doing and applying for a summer internship this summer. She can tell you more about it. We have shuttles for anyone coming from Detroit 
if you are here tonight and didn't come on a shuttle and you're interested in coming in the future, if you know someone from Detroit that would like to come here on a shuttle, the next one we're going to offer is on March 12th for Anna LaPay. Or you can catch a ride to class <laughs> with Mama Cherry. <laughs> Her email's at the bottom here. She'd be happy to give you a ride. Although I don't think she has a, do you have a red car? No. No, okay. It'll be a surprise. We have a film showing at the Michigan Theater this Thursday. Um, uh, it's called The Biggest Little Farm that some of you might be interested in. There's also the Local Food Summit for Washtenaw Food Policy Council is coming up, or the Washtenaw Local Food Summit is coming up on February 16th. Um, and the Detroit Food Summit as well is coming up March 7th and 8th. And the more recent one, the one that's coming up right away this weekend, is the Michigan Family Farms Conference. Um, so lots of exciting events that you all might want to get involved with. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Lily and to the panel. Great. Thank you, Leslie. So welcome, everybody. Um, we're so excited to have this panel tonight focused on seeds. We have a whole range of folks who we're going to learn from. Um, so we really tonight is about focusing on seeds and thinking about their significance in our food system. And we'll discuss all kinds of issues. One of the topics that we're going to talk about is who owns our seeds and our seed supply and why does it matter? Why do we even care? We'll talk about one of the most hot button topics that comes across in every food systems related event that I'm at. We're going to talk about GMOs and we're going to talk about how does gene editing technology relate to issues of biodiversity and human health and culture and power. So as you remember, and as Leslie has just said, that the theme of this 2019 Food Literacy for All course is called Planting Seeds of Resistance. And for folks who have been here for multiple classes, I'll just remind you that the very first class we heard from Davida Davison from Detroit, and she talked about how uh, many African women used to braid rice, rice or different seeds into their hair before crossing the ocean on slave ships and they would take the seeds with them as a survival strategy. Um, and then last week we heard from Chef Sean Sherman, the founder of The Sioux Chef, and he talked to us about indigenous agriculture and wild rice and about the lost diversity of so much indigenous cuisine, which of course has a lot to do with our seeds. So to help us further delve into these issues, we have an incredible panel here with us this evening. And um, I don't want to just you know, silo folks into one role, but if I have to, here's how I'm going to do it. We have a seed saver and a farmer. That's Eric right here. I'm gonna, a Antonio has like 15 different titles, but I'm for the moment I'm gonna call him an activist related to seeds. And then we have Krista who I'm gonna title as an academic, but I'm sure you have many more hats than just an academic. So thank you all for being with us. And the way that we are gonna start tonight, um, first I'll introduce Eric. So everyone's gonna give short presentations about what they do, and then we're gonna pose questions, to, or I'm gonna pose questions to the panel, and then at the end, like all of our classes, we're gonna open it up to question and answer from the audience. Um, so let me grab the clicker. And actually, bef let me, before I introduce Eric, we have a couple more questions to get you warmed up. Okay, which of the following is not a real name of a seed? One of my favorite things about seeds is their incredible names. Um, so which of the following is not a real name? So we've got A, flamingo spinach, B, purple passion asparagus, C, lily melon, D, full moon celery, or E, dragon's toe pepper. And yeah, what do you guys think? Don't tell them what you think. <laughs> and also, I don't usually field test questions before the class, but I did test them with three farmers ahead of time. Everyone fell flat <laughs> on their face for this one. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> we have a range of answers from the panelists. You guys think it's C. No, even, my name is Lily, but there is a Lily Melon. That is legit. Um, it looks like I fooled 20% of you. There's no full moon celery. Um, but the rest of them are legit names of seeds. <laughs> So, I mean, Eric, I'm just going to pass this to you. 
Um, okay, so now I want to introduce Eric Campy for our first speaker. He's a farmer and a seed saver, and he owns and operates a small farm business called the Ann Arbor Seed Company. And um, I've grown Eric seeds for five years in a row. They've done the best in my garden every single year, and I can't wait to try out some new varieties. So welcome up, Eric. We're glad to have you here. Great. Thanks. I think, I think this is on. All right. I'm standing up. Thanks, Lily. Um, woo. So does this work? Does this do a thing? <laughs> so I'll click at it, and then it'll tell you to, I get it. It works. Um, wow, OK, thanks for having me here. This is so exciting. I'm terrified. Um, my name is Eric Campy. I have a small farm business that's called Ann Arbor Seed Company. Um, here we grow over 60 varieties of crops uh, for seed. Um, and we also uh, grow produce that we sell uh, to eat as well. And uh, it's important to me to, to have that full, full cycle. Um, the, the seed saving informs the quality of the produce and the quality of the produce informs the seed saving. And so this picture here, which maybe looks better from where you're at, um, is uh, summertime. And on the far left, we've got calendula, which is a flower. It's also uh, very useful in a lot of uh, beauty products. Um, I just smash the flowers up, and uh, uh, the oils of it heal my cracked, dry farmer hands. Um, but they make it into soaps and stuff, too. And then on the right is sunflower. And so it must be June, because uh, only the first one is in bloom, if you can barely see it in the middle. So it hasn't, they haven't opened yet. And then in the middle, it would be hard to identify, that's radish. And so I, I like putting this picture up here because it's, 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 it's very abundant, but it also shows some of the fun of uh, doing seed saving as you get to see an unusual bloom. Click. Um, and so that brings me to sort of like why seed saving. And the first reasons for me is that I, I really fell in love with it. And I fell in love with the beauty of seed saving. And so you see a, a sunflower here on the left. And it's, it's just brilliant in its colors. And it, it's, it's very striking. Um, but like I hinted with the radish, um, I get to grow vegetable crops through their full life cycle. And so that means getting to see the flower of a uh, lettuce, um, which not all farmers uh, have that, that privilege. Um, it's also very interesting. I wish this was a little clearer, but here we have a crop that many of you probably know but haven't seen at this stage. This is spinach. And spinach is, uh, is, is dioecious, which means that there's a distinct male and female plant. And so the, the, the female is here uh, producing seeds, and, and the male is here uh, releasing pollen, and then uh, discreetly disappearing and getting out of the picture. Um, <laughs> click. Oh, right on time. It was perfect. Um, so another thing that's really uh, uh, fun for me about seed saving is uh, seed saving is participating in the food uh, that we eat. And so the, the pictures that I, I, I got up here for you on the left and on the right is carrot. And so we have the, the flower of the carrot in bloom. And then on the right, we have a uh, carrot on the, on the cutting board about to be dinner. And um, my, my, my point with showing this is that um, anytime you save seed, you're, you're involved in breeding work at some level because you're, you're choosing which seeds will, will carry on to the next. And seed saving, often when people ask me about seed saving, they get hung up on the mechanical aspects of it. Well, how do you do it? How do you get them from point A to point B? Or how do you clean it? And that's, I mean, that's a part of it, but that's really the easiest part of it, in my opinion. The, the reason we save seed is they are a storehouse of information. They are the knowledge. Um, a farmer might tell you they know how to grow a carrot, but they're really using shorthand for, I know how to put a carrot seed in the right conditions so that it can thrive. But the carrot seed knows how to grow the carrot. And the seed saver is is sort of leaning on that carrot seed and, 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 and making sure that that knowledge is, is well cared for. So the carrot on the, on the right, besides being uh, beautiful with all these different colors, it needs to be flavorful and it needs to be uh, vigorous. It needs to grow quickly 
Um, it needs to store well. It, it has all of these, these, these are at least my, in my opinion, my, my qualities that I'm looking for in a, in, a, in a wonderful carrot. And as a seed saver, it's my job to make sure that they're present in the carrots that I allow to go to seed and that I save seed from. Let's make sure I didn't forget anything here. That's good enough. Um, we click. Okay, oh boy. So the, the reason I threw this one up here is to not, so there's a test and you have to memorize all of these. Um, it's to show sort of, this is, this is a large graph of the seed industry and you can't see it. It's, a, it's an MSU professor that's put these together. This is at least the second version of it. It's probably the hundredth version of it. I don't know how many he's made. Um, but it, it, shows, it shows a very large industry that's owned by only really four big companies. Um, and it, it, it is, it's in the process of continually consolidating. Um, this is a, these, you're not going to see a lot of familiar names. Usually the seed industry will then brand it something that you would see in the store. Um, or the seed industry is really not working for you as a gardener or even you as a small farm owner or you as a big farm owner. It's, it's working for um, the larger agronomic agriculture. And so it's, it's working for big corn, soy, wheat. It's working for uh, large Central Valley, California farm operations. And so when, when people uh, come up to me in the farmer's market and they ask me if I'm part of Monsanto or if I'm selling genetic modified seed, it's, they're asking if I'm part of this bigger system. And so the alternative to this bigger system is sort of small and independent producers, which are, are really uh, not the norm. Um, let's see if I, I'm going to keep doing this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to dig more into this, uh, you should be following some of the Farmer to Farmer podcasts. And there's some really good ones, one by John Navazio and another by Frank Morton. And they'll, they'll go into some more depth about the state of the seed industry and, um, and who they're really growing for. And one account that they'll give, um, they use, uh, um, I think it's Navazio that uses spinach as an example. He's talking about the, the industry is, is providing spinach seed to like three different counties in California. And the criteria that they're selecting when they're saving that spinach seed is really for these large agronomic interests. It's not, they're not selecting for flavor, they're selecting for a specific disease resistance that's present in this one type of massive monocrop farm. And so when you're thinking of delicious spinach, those aren't the concerns that you're probably thinking about. And that's, uh, so I just wanted to show like the, the seed industry is this big thing that's, that's, that most people don't think about because of how removed we all have become from the, the, the broader uh, food, food systems. Okay, um, I guess we got a quiz coming up here. Um, and we're, we're talking about genetic modification. Um, and I often get questions at the farmer's market about it and so I'd like you guys to, to, to make a guess and say, so which product at the store you're, you're shopping is least likely, so this is the one that is least likely to involve a genetic modified organism. And it's A, a, a veggie burger, B, cabbage, C, long underwear, or D, ground beef. I think, I think all of these could be right, but I think there's one that's more right. <laughs> oh, and so is this, this is a, some, I love it, it's all over the board, except for someone who guessed E. Um, <laughs> I like that. Um, so my answer would be B, cabbage. And so the reason that I brought this up is because the, the, the GMO, the, 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 the biotech industry is pursuing large agronomic crops. So most of the genetic engineering is done to corn and soy, um, cotton. And so that's where the long underwear came in. Uh, so I think any of these answers could be GMO free. So the veggie burger, if it's labeled organic and GMO free project verified, 
that could be GMO free. But if it's not, it's probably made from a, a GMO soy, corn, possibly sugar beet. Um, the cabbage, to my knowledge, there's not a genetic modified cabbage. Um, and so, um, so that one's probably pretty clean. Um, and so one of the points that I want to make is when, when people are concerned about genetic modification, most of their concern is focused on the produce section of the grocery store. And that might be the most GMO free part of the grocery store. The, most of the GMOs are uh, at the rest of the store in the, the processed foods. Um, so I, I already talked about cotton long underwear. And then uh, ground beef, um, the animals are likely fed on uh, GMO feed. Um, unless it's a, a local, local small farm with a grass-fed animal, so know your farmer. Click. Um, and so here's an alternative. This is a small, small seed saving. And uh, um, this is uh, on the left is uh, Stacy, who works with me. She's uh, harvesting uh, lettuce seed there in a, into a bucket. And on the right is uh, me uh, cleaning. Um, it could be lettuce seed. I can't tell in that picture. Um, and I'm, I'm using a box fan. And so I really wanted to show that this is a very accessible thing. And so there is an alternative to, to large corporate control of our seed um, because it really is something that anyone can be involved in in a large way or a very small way. Um, this is not a $10,000 piece of equipment. It's an old box fan. Um, and so I think uh, um, uh, diversity and resilience is very important in our food system. And that should be in uh, the food that we eat and the seeds that, uh, that grow it. And um, if all of the seed uh, is owned by a few companies and a couple of white men, uh, that kind of diversity is very troubling. Um, and so we need more people involved. At least that's my opinion. And so click, last slide. Um, uh, I am Ann Arbor Seed Company. I would really appreciate it if you could you know, visit our website. is uh, a2seeds.com. Um, I sell produce to local restaurants in the area at the farmer's market. I have seed packs available to uh, farmers and uh, gardeners in the area. Um, we also have another small uh, seed farm uh, represented here. Erica and Mike from Nature and Nurture Seed are here. And so um, if you're interested at all, um, talk to them or talk to myself. And because uh, um, uh, the support of a small farm uh, really makes a, a big difference. Um, that's, that's all I got. Don't the clicker, it doesn't do anything. <laughs>
Um, so uh, after I graduated from college, I helped form a hip hop and art collective. I, f I helped form a hip hop and art collective called the Rise Up, uh, which stands for Rise is uh, Spanish for roots. And our motto is like everything good that starts grows uh, underground. So a lot of us are underground hip hop artists, graffiti artists, break dancers, uh, beat makers, media makers generally. Um, and we organized a lot of concerts in the park. And we would bring people together around hip hop and education. We'd hit them with knowledge. You know, we'd talk to them about issues that are affecting them, such as like the privatization of the education system in our community, or the water shutoffs, or the foreclosures. And we'd bring activists together with uh, different people. So this is some, a photo of one of our actions and uh, a photo of an educational event we did in uh, Southwest Detroit. Uh, so when I graduated from Eastern, Detroit was getting put into the process of bankruptcy and emergency management. I'm not sure if you've known too much about that. It's like y'all probably a little bit younger when it was going down, but um, essentially it's a, a financial takeover of the city. Uh, and for me, we, as an activist and organizer, somebody who'd studied what this looked like in Latin America, I was like, hell no, we don't need that shit in Detroit. So um, we were trying to get critical messages out there. Uh, the media wasn't listening to us. So for me, it's like I, I took to the walls and started tagging decolonize all over buildings just to like, kind of like a fuck you to uh, Snyder and emergency management. <laughs> I was uh, arrested in 2015 for painting Free the Water on this water tower. Um, it was in the middle of the, uh, the Flint water crisis and the Detroit water shut off. So when the emergency manager took over Detroit, uh, he tried to sell off the water system in order to make that water system balance sheet look a little better. He wanted to bring more income, so he started shutting off people's water, and he cut Flint off from the Detroit water system. And we all know what happened in the Flint water crisis. 100,000 to 200,000 people were lead poisoned in Detroit. About 120,000 people lost their water access for some period of time. Uh, so I tagged Free the Water on this uh, tower. We got busted climbing down from the tower, uh, and we had like this whole court case. Um, they had to ch they charged us with a bunch of felonies. We beat the felonies, I'm not in jail. It was good. <laughs> uh, this is a, a photo of somebody I'm really super inspired by, Noam Chomsky, big fan of his work. I got to, uh, our collective received an award from the National Lawyers Guild and I got to like speak before him. It was like the high, one of the high moments in life. Uh, and this is actually a protest here at U of M. Uh, I was in, when I was at Eastern Michigan University, I was part of a group that uh, fought to make it so that undocumented people could pay in-state tuition in Michigan. And I'm glad U of M and Eastern passed that, so that's super exciting. Uh, this is just some more of my graffiti uh, and artwork in Detroit. I painted this 16-story 16 story building called the Douglas Brewster Projects. That was illegal. Uh, this one right here is a bust of Columbus. That was illegal. I put an ax in his head. Uh, yeah. So as I was doing all this organizing and activism, I was like, I just really needed to heal myself. I needed to do something really positive. So. Uh, we took over this like abandoned spot in my neighborhood. This is like, you know, banks come and take the houses. Uh, out of work, poor people come and strip the metal out of the houses. The house gets burned down. It looks like shit. So we decided to clean up this couple lots. Uh, and we cut down a bunch of trees and brought in a lot of like wood chips. Uh, and yeah, it was like it, it, it became a really central node in our community. And speaking of nodes, one of the ways we're helping like, keep the lead in the soil and uh, improve the soil, we have a lot of cheap, cheap, crappy fill clay in Detroit. Um, so what we do is we put down like, a lot of wood chips because there's trees constantly being cut down, mostly by DTE, like all the time. And um, so we took the wood chips, which are free, put them on the ground, like eight to 10 inches of them, and then we uh, inoculated those wood chips with mushrooms. So we're able to get nice mushrooms going. Those are not edible, those are milk caps. Those are edible ones right there. Uh, and those are uh, wine cat mushrooms. So we're making rich soil and, and creating community in the process of um, starting this farm. And I live really close to Dearborn in a super Yemeni community. Shout out to the Arab corner over here, Arab Daisy corner. Um, so we brought a lot of soil in, started working on other people's uh, plots in the neighborhood. Uh, and this is a picture of a, a little girl named Tasneem planting some seeds in front of my house. Um, yeah, and it's just a really great opportunity to engage with y young folks in the neighborhood. This is kind of the start of the farm, this garlic patch. Yeah, many people love garlic and they take all the leaves before they ever grow. So like, I don't do garlic publicly anymore. It's like in my backyard. <laughs> um, yeah, there's some more mushrooms, a group of people working, this is my dog in front of the farm. Isn't he beautiful? He's such a beautiful pit bull. Uh, I'm also a beekeeper. Uh, I have a, 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 a farm and we have a, an apiary. So we're, I'm a part of a co-op of three beekeepers called Southwest Beetroit. 
you want to look up, up it's hashtag SWBEE Troit. Um, so that's, yeah, that's our farm, and we do a lot of workshops, a lot of educational stuff. We're doing some really kind of fun experiments with um, using fungi to treat varroa mites. Don't have time to talk about that today. Uh, another huge part of my work, which I think I'm like, I'm probably the most passionate about, is like getting young people outdoors. Uh, so these are all photos of uh, trips we've taken uh, with groups of black and brown folks from the city. I think it's a big problem that we don't have access to nature in Detroit, so uh, we do our best to take people out there. Uh, okay. Yeah, this is a quiz for you guys. Who are the native people of Michigan? Shout it out. There's no like little Anishinaabe. That's that's one of the groups. Yes. Sock and Fox. Damn. Okay. Okay. Who else? There's one more. Parwami, Chippewa, that's part of the Anishinaabe. Who else? Miami, that's close. I mean, it's like kind of this area-ish. I'll just put it up here. You take a picture of this if you want to, uh, super fast, because I'm going flip to flip this away in two seconds. But the group you guys didn't mention was the Wendat, and they're actually part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. But like, they weren't part of the Confederacy. They actually kind of fought with them, but they have a similar language, the Wendat. And they are like uh, had a permanent settlement south of Detroit. Um, so I was actually on this panel because I was asked to speak in, in, uh, for Sid Martin, who's featured in this photo here in front of these uh, birch bark, ba or these, um, I think, ash baskets. Uh, one of the really amazing things that the indigenous community of Michigan has been working on is uh, fighting to rematriate seeds and rematriate remains from indigenous graves. So anthropologists and folks, they find a grave, like, hey, this is interesting, let's dig it up, let's take these bones. Those are sacred uh, ancestors for Anishinaabe people. Um, and they would often visit them. It was part of like, this feast of the dead in the fall. Like, it's really important to honor your ancestors and native culture. Uh, and I was super excited when I was invited to come and be a part of the ceremony for uh, rematriating both remains of, uh, uh, of indigenous peoples as well as seeds that U of M uh, has in the Mathai Botanical Gardens where, where they were kept. So um, this is actually flint corn that's uh, from Wapo. Uh, I was actually just at Wapo yesterday. That was my quiz. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's really exciting work. Uh, this is part of the Graves and Repatriation of Indigenous Remains Act. It's called NAGPRO is what it's called. Um, so that's really cool. This is us actually planting this rematriation garden at Mathai Botanical Gardens. Uh, and the seeds that came from, I don't have a photo of the actual, like, how it turned out, but the seeds that we planted in this garden are now being re-gifted back to the Wapo Island, and they haven't had their flint corn seed in, like, a couple hundred years. So it's a really big deal that that seed is coming back to that indigenous community, and they plan to grow uh, flint corn. Another part of my work is uh, working with my friend uh, with the Lifeways Institute. Uh, this is a project we were building birch bark canoes. Um, and this is kind of, like, gets to like the broader context around like seed sovereignty and saving seeds. I think like there's seeds of resistance, you know, seeds of like thought that I'm planting in young people's minds in my community. Seeds of like a, a beautiful like indigenous future, like a, a beautiful post-colonial future. And that's only represented by, um, you know, the growth and the advancement and the existence of indigenous cultures. So they literally like harvested these birch barks from trees, cut them down, did everything to literally make all of this stuff by hand. Uh, so it's really beautiful to see and, be, and partake in that work. Uh, another like seed work that we're, we don't think about too much is uh, uh, wild ricing. I think uh, you said Sean Sherman was talking about that last week. I've had the honor of uh, ricing with the Anishinaabe communities for the last three years. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is a wild ricing photo. Uh, yeah, and then the other piece of it is just like seeds of resistance is just like fighting back against all the pollution in the hood uh, where I grew up. Uh, there was actually a huge like DTE spill thing that just happened this weekend. So any support y'all could do to Amjanang and 4827, we appreciate. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say is we can't just like resist and fight. There's like things that we can control. And one of the things that I feel like we can't control in the city is culture. So we, uh, as an organization, uh, the Rise Up fought to end Columbus Day. And we got that passed in 2017 and we celebrated the first Columbus Day uh, in 2018 with the city. Uh, this end of this fall, we're going to have this decolonial solidarity feast with like the, a lot of leaders in the African American community. Uh, so yeah, we're got to rebuild this. I don't just like fucking kill Columbus. I also want to like end his legacy in the city too and, and change those things that we can't control. So thank you. Thank you so much, Antonio. 
And next, I want to introduce our third panelist. Krista Isaacs is an assistant professor at Michigan State University, and she's in the Department of Plant, Soil, and Microbial Science. Uh, her research focuses on seed systems, and particularly for smallholder farmers, and it's rooted in a transdisciplinary perspective that integrates participatory processes and crop ecology and plant breeding. And she integrates all of that with gender studies. And her research primarily focuses on improving smallholder access and availability to preferred quality seed based mainly in Africa and in Latin America. So you're up next, Krista. Thanks for being here. All right, thanks. I think I'm going to stand over. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, so I think that was a good summary of what I do, and hopefully there's a little bit more in here to um, give you an idea of some of the major questions that I try to address when I'm thinking about seeds and seed systems. And I want to start out with the idea of pluralistic seed systems, so this idea that there's a lot of different ways to think about how we get seed, where it comes from, who makes it, and those types of things. So one of the things, um, well, so when we think about seeds of resistance, there's a lot of different metaphors out there about seeds. There's about seeds of hope. Um, it's used as a way to like create new um, initiatives. It's used to, um, it's used in the Quran. It's used in the Bible. And seeds is also as a metaphor for resistance. And one of my favorite quotes is quisieron enterarnos, pero no sabían que éramos, éramos semillas. And this translates to they tried to bury us, but they, don't, but they didn't know we were seed. And it's pretty interesting when you stick this in to Google in Spanish, the types of images that come up are these ones, ones about resistance, or about voices not being heard, and about um, it's related to the Zapatista movement and to corruption, and a lot of different things like that. When you put it in there in English, you get kind of bubbly um, pictures of clouds and skies. And <laughs> they tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were seed. <laughs> so this is kind of a metaphor as well for the work that I try to do and working with small holder farmers in different countries, um, trying to make sure that they're getting the types of varieties and seeds that they want to have and that they need to have that are culturally appropriate. So there is at least 500 million smallholder farmers worldwide, and they work in a lot of different conditions with a lot of different um, needs in terms of cultural and uh, social and e economic needs. Uh, is the volume working? Okay, that guy should be moving already. Is there a way to hit play? <laughs> nope. I just want to... Nope. Nope. Anyway, there's, um, this is a man in Guinea. I was talking to him about Fonio, which everyone should know about. It's this amazing, uh, very nutritious cr uh, grass seed. It's kind of like, um, it's a millet. And it's as nutritious as quinoa or more. It has complete amino acid uh, with, except for lysine. Anyway, this farmer is broadcasting it by hand in his, in his field into this tiny little seed. And the sound of this is just beautiful. It's just like the seed hitting the grass, the ground. Anyway, um, so I work on a lot of different seeds. I work on, on crops. I work on phonio, sorghum. Uh, sometimes orange flesh sweet potato, and also common bean, like your kidney beans. So there's a lot of different ways to talk about seeds and a lot of different ways to talk about seed systems. And this is the most simplified version um, that I like to think about. And kind of it's framed within the same way that food security is framed. And this is how seed security is considered as well. So access is a farmer's ability to actually afford to be able to pay for and get the seed. Availability is whether or not it's physically present. So in a lot of communities in rural areas in Africa that I've worked in, and 
right now. I'm sorry if I'm if I say Africa. I work in specific countries that are, and there's a lot of different ones. But it's um, some I slip into saying Africa, but it's not the whole place. <laughs> anyway, so availability is rural areas. Um, just they're actually being the seed there. That doesn't mean that it's the farmer's preferred seed, though. It doesn't mean that it's the seed that they would ideally grow for that environment or for their cultural needs in terms of food or processing. So that's another factor that goes into how the seed system functions and provides security to a farmer. And I may be talking about the international environment, but I'm also er, um, an international setting, but this also applies here. And especially when we think about um, more marginal growers that are maybe organic systems or um, small, small farmers in the U.S. So seed quality is your classic factors like seed germination, vigor, and then resilience is whether these seed, whether that system, that seed system can respond to different shocks that happen to it, whether that's humanitarian, some political issues, whatever it is that the seeds can either respond, that there's enough of a system there and support network that the system continues to function despite those things, and including climate. So, I think, uh, <laughs> they're also very, this is kind of really, it's, it's really hard to see them. I'm gonna stand here. <laughs> so here we have, it's okay, yeah, pluralistic. So the pluralistic seed systems, this is just kind of the yellow boxes I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, are more what our industrial, formal seed system looks like. We have genetic resources, which are either, are probably from a gene bank. There's breeding that happens. Those varieties get released. They're multiplied and marketed. And then the center circle is more what is considered an informal system of smallholder farmers in different countries in the global south. So there's more like what you see where there's seed selection what Eric was kind of talking about, where you're selecting your seed, you're actively part of a breeder as well in the process, and then you're sharing that through your networks, your family, your either on the market, any of those things. But in reality, so a lot of these two are um, kind of the formal and the informal are talked about separately, but there's a lot of overlapping ways that seed are transferred between both these types of systems. And it really, um, it really depends on the crop, which is right here. <laughs> uh, so the types of seed systems that farmers are using vary depend, depending on the crop. So that first, um, the first crop up there was beans. And those are open pollinate, they're self-pollinated, and they can be saved very easily from year to year. And so farmers, but they also have issues with storage. So farmers may try to save it, but if they're living in a very tropical place where insect damage is a problem, then they might be actually getting their bean seed from the market. Uh, sweet potatoes are propagated by a vine. So by the, and so the way that farmers save that is a little different. You come to maize or corn, which is our classic example of hybrid and GMO, then there's a whole different system behind that and it follows more the formal system in a lot of places. This, that last slide with all the words, um, I was never intending to read them to you. You'll get to see them kind of <laughs> individually here. So I just want to go through a few um, concepts that I think are kind of interesting. So variety development is based on the voices that are heard. So when we have plant breeders producing varieties, they're often for the industries, they're for the industry, or even in this setting, Often the plant breeders, if they're going to talk to the people that they're growing variety or developing varieties for, they go and talk to the men in the field about the agronomic traits. But there's a whole lot of other issues that are happening behind the scenes that they're not finding out about. So women, this is about sorghum and molly, women attach, associate um, the yield of sorghum with the food yield. Not the yield that comes off the field, but the amount of yield that they get in terms of food. So like in terms of the amount of flour that they can produce from a variety. And if breeders aren't talking to um, different voices like the women or 
different people that have roles in producing this food, then they're not developing varieties that work. So I'm already out of time, amazingly. Um, <laughs> so uh, another factor is, let's go here. So seed companies concentrate on crops that are profitable, so on hybrids, GMOs, um, and related to also what Eric was saying, that there aren't that many, uh, there's, there's a huge concentration of seed in global seed company, in, in seed company, Ooh. there's a huge concentration of seed companies and they're not really in Africa, is basically what this is saying, and they concentrate on very specific crops. Crop diversity is underutilized, and uh, there's, this is a great website that maybe you can snap a picture of. It goes through all the different types of edible plants that are out there and the types of plants that we can use for other, um, for textiles and for building. And basically, we focus on 150 crops for all of our food needs, even though there are 30,000. And these genetics are a source of robust, resilient, and nutritious food. Do I have any more time? I don't know. <laughs> so seed for marginal farming systems are neglected by policy, seed companies, and often plant breeders. And this just is a quick um, graph showing, so this is, looking at uh, hybrid sorghum varieties that are being grown in Mali. And the people that are benefiting from those hybrid varieties are men. The women are allotted different types of fields that have lower soil fertility, and so their fields are, aren't responding to the fertilizers as well, and they don't respond to the hybrid varieties that have been produced. And there's a lot of different types of systems that varieties and seeds are not developed for. So organic systems, there's very few breeders for different types of intercropping systems, for marginal environments. There aren't plant breeders or people that work on seed for those environments that up in the larger types of systems. So to end with, what does the future look like? What they presented in terms of the, um, the seed companies and the concentration of power there is kind of what is called seed capitalism. And then we have the other side of it with seed sovereignty that is more about localization and um, open source seeds. And then there's something in between that combines these two realities. And I don't, we can talk about this, whether what's possible and where, where that triangle might need to end up or what we would like it to look like. But so, and this, the triangle representing the, the, the two kind of work. Yeah, I think you get it. <laughs> anyway, so here's a whole bunch of resources. I don't know if you have access to the slides, but there's pretty interesting stuff here and um, some references. But yeah. OK, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Um, so before, we do have a few more clicker questions, but first we just want to do a little discussion here. Um, so I, I've noticed in, in many of your presentations, we've, we've already been bringing up and sort of throwing around, we talk about GMOs a little bit, we've talked about hybrids have come up a lot. Um, I think even heirloom varieties have come up in one of the, one of the t presentations. And I just want to um, back up and see if we can start by just defining those things. I think we have a range of folks in the room and it's not necessarily obvious to everyone what all of those are. So can either one of you or a range of you tag team that to give your explanations? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, oh boy. Um, so uh, all of the seeds that I grow are open pollinated and um, am I still on? Yeah, I just Okay. <laughs> oh, a stupid farmer doesn't know how to work his mic. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, all of the seeds that I grow are open pollinated, and that refers to seeds that um, are, are pollinated in the normal, natural fashion. Um, pollen is exchanged through a flower by a pollinator, like a bee or an insect or the wind. Um, open pollinated seed varieties have have some 
human influence in them, where the, the varieties traits are maintained by humans selecting in isolation, but it's not a laboratory type thing. Anyone, an amateur in a garden can save seed uh, from open pollinated varieties. Heirloom varieties are all open pollinated. Heirloom is sort of like antique. Uh, it generally refers to open pollinated varieties that are of a certain age, like before the Green Revolution or World War II or 50 years old or however you want to define it. I like to think of heirlooms as varieties that are saved or selected for a specific um, human need. Like uh, a gardener would save a tomato because it's very tasty. A, a chef would be interested in a pepper that has a certain flavor profile um, rather than an industrial need like uh, shipping or uniform harvest. Um, heirlooms, um, I, or bleh, uh, hybrids, I don't save any hybrid seeds, so I'm, I'm getting out of my expertise, but they're an intentionally uh, created cross from two separate inbred lines. Um, gardeners can do their own heirloom seeds, uh, uh, F1 hybrid seed saving, so I am not opposed to it. Um, it is one of the quickest ways to naturally introduce changes. So if you want to introduce a disease resistance or specific trait quickly without doing a very slow selection process, um, hybrids are your way. Uh, the problem I have with hybrids is like Coca-Cola, you don't have to tell anyone how you did it and you can keep the, the, the strain secret. And so um, that can be a, a profitable way for a seed company to have an exclusivity. Um, so for instance, all of the open pollinated seeds that I sell, you could buy them and save your own seed. And if you think you can do a better job of it, you don't need me, which is beautiful. Um, with F1 hybrids, that may not be the case. Um, and then GMO is a, a unnatural introduction of genetic material. So that, that's. So who, can, who can give us a bit more background on GMOs? Uh, actually, I just want to add about hybrids, though, um, that they also take place in nature. They're not just... Ooh. So if you think of about... Uh, I'm going to get this wrong. But I think a cross between a horse and a mule makes a donkey, and that's a hybrid. They're stronger... Nope, I got it wrong. Horse and a donkey. Horse and donkey make a mule. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd get it wrong. So that's also a hybrid, and it happens in nature, right? So, and it, and which one is the name? It makes a mule. It makes a mule. So the mules are the ones that are great for packing up a mountain. They're super strong. They have a lot of what they call hybrid vigor. And that's why a lot of people try to produce hybrid crops, because they have a natural innate vigor that often um, so, uh, what was, and then there's GMOs, which <laughs> we want to, I don't, it, there's different ways to define GMOs actually, as there are heirlooms, as far as I know. I was recently talking to someone and he said he didn't even know, he, like people talk about heirlooms that could be 20 years old or 50 years old, and I think how you defined it was quite nice actually, something that would be saved and is valuable for some reason or not. But so GMOs, there's gen genetically modified organisms. It can, be, it can be genetic engineering that is used to, um, you can use genes from the, within the same plant to modify it, which could be a quicker way of plant breeding. And it, or there's transgenic, which is where you're introducing a gene from another species into yeah, um, so I was actually, um, I get pulled in to do a lot of random stuff, uh, and I was a speaker at this thing called CRISPR-Con. <laughs> have you, how many people have heard of CRISPR? A lot of you, that's good. So for those of you who haven't, CRISPR is essentially like, uh, there's a thing called like bacteria, and they are attacked by viruses, bacteria, so they have uh, something in their immune system that allows them, it's a molecule, CRISPR-Cas9, uh, and it takes a piece of gene and it moves it so it can save a piece of that gene in case that bacteria or virus attacks it again. So scientists harbored this um, ability from bacteria and now they use it to more directly change uh, plants or whatever. Um, so I don't know, there's, there's been, it's, it's the most recent version of genetic modification. Early genetic modification was like throwing silver and gold ions at plants and just kind of seeing what happened. 
Uh, there was early genetic modification that they did with radiation by uh, exposing people, animals, things to radiation and seeing what comes out from it. Um, I guess like the problem isn't like necessarily the, the, the technology and a lot of people are kind of like focused on the technology but uh, the problem is the corporations that are doing it and the fact that 90% of transgenic seeds are owned by one company, Monsanto. Um, and 90% of that cultivation happens in the United States, and the United States is pushing this across the entire world all over the place. So there's like, there's a geopolitical side to uh, seed, say, to, or, uh, to um, the conversation about GMOs that we're not having. It's kind of like the conversation about guns. Like, we individualize gun control to talk about like what Johnny's doing with his dad's gun, when we should be talking about the a huge amount of arms the United States ships across the world. You know, like there's like there's always a geopolitical element to all of these technologies, and it's like there's like you know high suicide rates happening in India because they can't afford to buy Monsanto seeds. Monsanto's floating in, their corn is floating into other places, and you know dirtying up other people's seeds, and some people are being sued for that. Uh, there's a lot of crappy things happening. Uh, one thing that we were talking about earlier in the in the the field uh, is Monsanto. So Europe has said no to GMOs, like as a, as the EU. But like Dow, which is a huge, uh, huge company, they actually bought out Monsanto. Uh, so they're probably like, Monsanto is like, has a big stain on its reputation. So I anticipate Germany, the strongest country in the EU, will be trying to push for, you know, uh, GMO stuff in your opinion. And you you didn't mean to, but you just led into this, this yeah. clicker yeah. question. <laughs> so, to, sorry to interrupt you, Antonio, yeah. but a quick true or false about <laughs> Monsanto, since Antonio just brought it up. Um, True or false, Monsanto no longer exists. So the answer's just false. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, yeah. they, they, I think they still keep them as a shell. Like it, it's just doubt. So. Yeah, they'll know. probably get rid of the name. Yeah. All right, what do we have? Or they won't, because they figure there's no consequences to any of their actions. It's yeah. the usual. For real. Okay, you guys are not sure. It's kind of a trick question. Um, maybe our panelists can explain, but Monsanto, the name no longer exists, because after they merged with Bayer, the they're ditching, Monsanto has really not bad Dow. connotation with their name, so they've, they've shed their name. So as a, as a company, they no longer have that name. Um, yeah. but I, I don't totally mean to interrupt the flow with this, but Antonio started talking about um, that the real issue, you said something, Antonio, you were saying that the issue isn't necessarily with the technology, but with the consolidation of power. Yeah, the, yeah, but monopolies generally. I mean, the United, in countries support monopolies, there's like, it happens a lot. I mean, it's kind of like the era we're in. It's like, you know, Walmart's taking over everything. Like, it's kind of like what our country does is like push major, like a couple of major corporations. Um, but yeah, I think that like the concentration of uh, that system within one institution's hands is like a bigger problem. And then related to that, it's, the entire industrial agricultural model is like very detrimental to like the earth. I mean, so when I was at this CRISPR-Con, this sounds weird, I, I, st I spent the night in the room of a guy who worked for the US State Department, super weird, random. I was in DC, and I was in Boston for an extra day, and um, I was just like drunk debating this man all night. <laughs> and he's saying like the, the world, the growth of the population is super, super, a big thing, especially in like Africa, uh, Nigeria in particular is a huge budding population. I think the average woman has like six to eight kids there. Um, so he's saying like feeding the world is what GMOs will, will do for the world. Um, but that, I don't think that's necessarily like accurate because uh, small farmers truly feed the world. I mean, three, three quarters of the, of the food that's produced in the world is made by small farmers on 8% of the farmland. So on 8% of the farmland, they're, they're providing three quarters of the food the problem is like this industrial model the United States has, and we're trying to push the old model out everywhere and introduce a model that we control and that's centralized into a, a corporation that's run, you know, like in, in the government is, a, I mean, the government and corporation, hella overlap, you know what I'm saying? Like, and that's the problem. Like that really becomes the problem at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, I mean, industrial, I, I, would, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about like the creation of industrial agriculture. I know a bit about like it in Michigan because, um, MSU kind of came out of a land grant college. So I'm, the history of Michigan is like we're a one industry state. We were beavers and then we were trees and then we cut down all the trees. There's like all this open land. 
So like MSU comes along and starts parceling away that land and working with farmers to like help support farm and or early agriculture in places like um, Saginaw where all the you know, trees were cut down. Uh, so I'd love to hear kind of like how that industrial process began because I think that like industrial process is a big part of the conversation around GMOs as well as uh, the monopoly of seed corporations. I don't think that I can speak to the whole process of industrialization, but I think one of the interesting things that relates back to seeds is how seeds became something that was a commodity that was always purchased. And in the United States, um, all the way back in the early 1800s, there weren't a lot of seeds that were uh, useful or working for farmers, and the government actually requested there to be um, all the diplomats that were overseas to come back with lots of seeds. And they created um, all these free, free seed saving opportunities that were delivered through the, the post office to reach all the different farmers. And it was free seed. And that was happening up until 1924. For about 20 years before that, there were lobbyists that were pushing for um, seed to be, it was the, it was a seed association group. I can't remember exactly who they're called, what they're called. That was lobbying for seed to not be given away free. And that 1924 is also about when hybrid corn was developed. And hybrid corn in a lot of situations had 100% higher yield than, than uh, the, rate, the local variety of corn. And so back to what you were saying about hybrids is that they, it is a way to control the market and make and have people to purchase. So people have to keep purchasing the seed every year in order to get the same high yield. And so these companies didn't want there to be free seed. They wanted to be able to sell seed year after year. Uh, and so, the, yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna stop there. So so far we've we've touched on some of the who owns the global seed supply. Um, we've touched on some of the issues related to GMOs and, and power again about our control. I wanna ask you guys to touch on a couple other topics that come up a lot related to GMOs we haven't yet talked about, which are usually the most hot button issue is the effect of GMOs on human health and to eat them, what does that mean? And I also really wanna make sure that we focus on the influence, if, if anyone can speak to the influence of GMOs on biodiversity and environmental issues. Um, if you can tackle either or both of those, that'd be great. Sure. Um, all right. Um, I think they're actually pretty related. Um, one of the things that troubles me about uh, biotech and GMO or just the consolidation of the seed industry in general is the, the lack of diversity in our food system. And so um, uh, from a human health point of view, I, don't, I can't speak to whether a genetic modified crop is more or less healthy from a non-genetic modified crop. Uh, is it more or less digestible or is it more or less nutritious? Um, but I think diversity is very important. Um, from a nutrition point of view, but also from a, a broader uh, health of the ecology point of view. Um, and so as, as our seed industry becomes more and more consolidated, the diversity of the crops that are being grown um, is continuing to reduce. And so I, I think that has um, uh, profound effects um, in terms of health and resiliency of our food system. Um, also, uh, a lot of the genetic modification um, is done in coordination with a chemical-based agricultural uh, paradigm. And so uh, the, the Roundup Ready corn that's so ubiquitous, um, it, it has less to do with corn yield and more to do with the resistance to, do, uh, to uh, glyphosate, to this uh, Roundup uh, poison. And so uh, farming corn, has to do with the number of tractor passes over your field. Your acreage is huge, and if you can drive that tractor over that field one last time, um, you've saved a lot of resources. And so instead of the model where you had to mechanically cultivate the weeds, so kill the weeds um, by dragging some piece of equipment over the ground many times, um, they go over at once uh, spraying, carpeting the ground with this poison that the corn normally would be killed by, but it's instead been engineered to be resistant to this, this herbicide. Um, 
And so is it healthier to, to make common practice the broad application of this herbicide over such a large uh, portion of our, our land um, and some of our best soils? Um, I would say no. Do we even need that much corn? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's like 8% of the corn that's produced in the United States is eaten by people. And like something like 30% or 20% is eaten by animals. And the rest is like oil, like, you know, biodiesel and random ass like plastic. There's a lot of weird stuff made from seeds. Animal feed. Yeah, animal feed. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to, I guess in terms of the biodiversity conversation, um, industrial, or ag industrial agriculture is like a huge threat to the bees and pollinators. Um, and it's, a lot of that is about flower diversity. Uh, just the fact of the matter is, is that there's not much open pasture that much anymore. Um, a lot of flowers are becoming increasingly rare. Glyphosate is building up a lot in different ecosystems. Um, and when you're, I mean, just think about the millions of gallons that are poured onto every field each year and how that flushes through the, the, the system. Um, so yeah, like the, we've seen huge, huge losses in, in, in bees. Like there's also a, a pesticide called neonicotinoids. And it kind of like uh, mimics uh, nicotine, which in itself is kind of like an, an insecticide. Um, and uh, yeah, that has like, as, as a beekeeper, like um, it's really hard to keep our bees from year to year. It's like really, really expensive. And just like industrial agriculture kind of like took over small farming. Like I think 1% of the US population is involved in agriculture formally. Um, and most of it's big ag. Uh, the same thing has happened to beekeeping. So there was a lot of small beekeepers all over the country. Now it's like 97 to 96% of beekeeping is done by uh, beekeepers who ship their bees all over the country and they have like thousands and thousands of bees. And that's most honey that you intake as well. And those bees get flown to like places where they're spray spraying fungicides and pesticides all over the flowers while the bees are there pollinating too. So bees are kind of bioaccumulating a lot of pesticides in their systems. Uh, so small scale beekeeping is really, really important, but like doing it correctly and knowing how to do it uh, is super helpful for um, not spreading other, you know, issues. I mean, I could talk about like varroa mites and vectors for disease, but that's kind of like really strange and uh, <laughs> rude. It's like not relevant, but yeah. Great. So we have a little 15, 20 minutes left. So I have a few more questions, but I first just want to see what kind of questions are out in the audience, and then if we have time, we can come back to some of my questions. Um, so um, here, Jerry can, Jerry can have a mic. So let's see, what kind of questions do you guys have? Okay. How many of you grow stuff? Anybody have hands? Are you guys grow stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Any questions on the site? <laughs> okay, just state your name. My name is Kathy, and my question is for Eric, and my question is, what is the thing that you're gonna grow this year that you're most excited about? <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. That's a good question. <laughs> oh my goodness. Kathy, Kathy, can you say, now we say our name and who we are, what we do, or our role in the food system. Can you say something else to you? I'm a local food enthusiast. <laughs> 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 Kathy's one of the owners of Argus Farm Stop, which is a wonderful consignment shop here in Ann Arbor. They have two locations, and they sell food from local farmers, including myself, um, and a good cup of coffee, too. Hey, Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. Um, oh, my goodness. I can't pick. Um, <laughs> I've sort of accidentally become like kind of a good lettuce grower and mm. man, um, both for seed and for produce and uh, several of the local restaurants have been uh, buying head lettuce from me and, um, and as a seed crop it's become one of our consistently high quality seeds. Um, so that's, that's really one of the first things that's, that's coming to mind. And this time of year, too, I'm craving a good salad. Oh, man. So I've got a Forellenschluss, which is the speckled trout belly. Um, it's a uh, tender romaine. Um, I've got a, uh, um, it's called Pirat, and it's a butterhead. It's, uh, it's, it's a light green, but then it's blushed with like a pink on the outside. 
And then we were talking about win winter density earlier, compact, mini romaine, real tough. Yeah, I'm a um, huge fan of winter density. Real, tr real trooper. Um, I've got a red Redina variety. I've got another butterhead called Supermoto. Mm. Oh, and I'm forgetting Cosmo, another romaine, green romaine. And that, so that's seven varieties, and I, it would kill me to take one of them out of the list. And the farm that I learned seed saving from, we maintain 50 different varieties of lettuce. And 50 different varieties of lettuce is nothing. There are thousands right. and thousands. So also, I'd, but I want to make sure to point out, do, do you guys, do Mike and Erica, who are from Nature and Nurture Seeds, do you guys have your seed catalogs here today? Cool. So if folks want to peruse them, um, I know I asked that question at the beginning of the with the amazing seed names, but maybe you can pass them out during class and folks can just kind of get an idea of some of the local seed around. Thank you. Anybody else have questions? Yes, that's my, that's my my yes. yes. Yeah. I got some from Greg earlier, actually. Weiler from oh. uh, hi, I'm Danielle. I like soil and community gardens. And I have a question for you, Antonio, about what you do you're doing an urban farm and you went from something that was covered with the building, so like bare soil, yeah. and then you're adding in a bunch of wood chips and like organic matter. What are you doing to like continue to improve the soil and like make sure that your food doesn't have potential yeah. like stuff in it? So we definitely tested the soil. There's a, there's a really wonderful program called Keep Growing Detroit in the city of Detroit, and they'll actually, if you participate in the program and volunteer at one of their volunteer days, they'll test your soil for free. So we tested the soil, that was a big piece of it. Uh, but we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't test every single location on the five lots that we run. So it's more likely that there is some in places where the house is burned down and there's still a little bit of soil left from the old house. So generally speaking, we just really covered the place with like pretty much like eight inches of wood chips. And we bring, continue to bring wood chips year to year. One problem with getting that much wood chips is like as wood chips decompose, they eat up a lot of nitrogen. So like we, uh, we add like some bone meal. Um, we also uh, did like put the fungi in. So we let that sit for a couple of years too. So we kind of like started in another area and just added a ton of compost to that area. Uh, but that's mostly what we're working with is compost and uh, wood chips, uh, coffee grains. Um, and like it's really a pretty nascent young operation, you know, like I was picking up coffee grinds from like a local place for a while, but like kind of gets hard to do it all the time. And I have so many other interests, so it's like really tough. Uh, but like I'm applying for like nonprofit status in the next couple of years, and I'm hoping to like kind of go that way to fund. Uh, to we're we're hoping to get the infrastructure up enough in the farm to go into like full time, uh, you know, farming and agriculture, having like a, a, a genuine market garden. But at this point, like just community garden has been real fun and fine. Yeah. Anyone else? In the back. Um, I'm a Quillen and I grow for the community farm of Van Arbor. Eric, I'm wondering, I tried to grow lettuce seed outside last summer and it sucked because I was going to harvest it and then it rained. Do you have any good ideas for growing lettuce seed outside, not in a hoop house? Um, so yeah, um, uh, we grow our lettuce seed outside too and it, it usually, the harvest is usually truncated by a, 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 a storm. Um, uh, getting uh, first of all, the, the crop that you want to save seed from should be um, one of your earliest field crops um, so that it has enough time. Um, and then, uh, honestly, it's a little bit of fingers crossed that a storm doesn't... Uh, so I guess to, a little background. Uh, uh, lettuce, uh, you've seen it as a head. When it bolts, it grows up and it gets to be about waist high and it, uh, um, somewhat like a dandelion, the seed it has a little tuft at the end of it. Um, and if it, if it rains too hard on it, it gets this sort of like wet dog kind of thing, and it, it, it's hard to harvest from it any longer. Um, honestly, I, I can't give you much advice other than plant it early, um, grow a, a, a healthy, vigorous crop, and then once you can start seeing those tufts, harvest twice a week from it. Um, is this for food or for uh, seed saving? For seed, right? Yeah, for seed. Oh. <laughs> good, good luck. Can you dry it? Sure. It's very hard to clean. Hi, my name is Emily. I'm a master's in public health student interested in how land use can promote health in communities. Um, my question is, 
How, can you guys talk a little bit about climate change and how that is affecting seed systems and kind of what you all do? Well, gonna go for it, I'll please. start out with the way, it, well, so I think the crop diversity that we've all kind of touched on is one of the key elements for dealing with issues with climate change. That's where our genetic resources are, to be able to find varieties and crops that are going to work in changing environments and, different, and that are resilient to fluctuations from, not even in terms of temperature, but within rainfall patterns within the season early and late start dates. And um, yeah, so Fonio that I was really excited about um, is actually really great for that because it grows in highlands and really high rainfall areas and it grows all the way in the Sahel where it's really dry. And so it's an excellent crop that um, is incredibly underutilized. Well, in West Africa, it's a staple crop, but outside of there, it's not used. And so there's a ton of diversity out there that I think can be tapped into uh, for dealing with climate change. Um, yeah, I, we're like the number one oil producing country in the world right now. Like fracking is the dumbest shit in the world. Like I understand like, like everybody's all psyched about Hillary Clinton. She had a, a part of her state department develop like intentionally for pushing fracking all over the world. I mean, it is one of the most dangerous technologies. Like, the kids of our kids are going to not know a time where there's clean groundwater in some places, in many places. Um, so, like, we need all of you wealthy white people with money to shake the system up and, like, push back on our fascist government that we're living under right now. Because, <laughs> seriously, I mean, I, I'm not shitting, like, like, and then we're subjected to all of it. I mean, I showed pictures of it. Like, that's, that's how we live in the hood. Like, I could see at the end of my block, I live three miles away from US Steel, there's a perpetual flame at the end of my block. I can see it from my, like, and so it's those, those of us who are living in the, the communities that are most impacted by it, um, yo, like, our voices aren't heard. You know, the things, the complaints that we have aren't seen, they're not made visible. So telling those stories, going into those communities, seeing what people are experiencing on the front lines of people impacted by it are super helpful, but we need to shake up the rural places that you people come from because like y'all are a big problem, seriously. Like, I mean, like for real, like the, the red part of the country, I mean, and I, I just don't get it because the, like the Republican party is not working for anybody's, their interests in any way, shape or form. Like, I, I don't know, I think there's a huge need to make some connections between like the rural and urban sort of like analysis, people, communities. Um, yeah, and I, I, I don't know, I think organize, 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 but like of course climate change is gonna impact farming. Like we've seen fluctuations in the seasons, like I mean in terms of like health, like when there's not a deep freeze, uh, there's a lot of like extra allergens in the air. I mean everybody's impacted by all of these things and we see it every day. And we're, we're quite a bit warmer in the city, so like record high temperatures has people like, you know, getting sick, falling out. Um, I don't know, it's, but the natural gas system is a big, big, big prob problem. It's not a green energy. Like technically in, the, in Michigan, we consider fracking a green technology, and that, that is not a green technology, and we need to protect these damn lakes. Um, so if you have ideas for working on things, this is my Instagram, holla at me. Follow me. Let's work together on this. I'm serious. Like this is like really, really important. So, huh? <laughs> Say what? Follow back. I will. Sure. Yeah. Antonio, you mentioned uh, earlier, just uh, just briefly about the the DTE and marathon yeah. issue that occurred this week. Yeah. Down in your area, can you touch on that a little bit more? Yeah. So. Um, 48217 is the most polluted zip code in the country. It's kind of like a historically middle-class black auto worker community. Uh, and that, if you actually look in Detroit, like a voter turnout, like voter turnout is the highest in 48217 of any place in the city. And like they cannot vote to, st to slow down Marathon. Marathon just got a $9 billion expansion uh, in that area. And uh, yeah, they're, they're processing a lot of uh, gas and oil. Um, and just this past week, uh, there was 
a release of some sort of, some sort of pollutant. Uh, a lot of people were coughing, feeling sick, going outside, getting nauseous and vomiting. Uh, and that's like the people who live in uh, Dearborn, Detroit, in that kind of 48217 River Rouge e-course, which is a majority black and Hispanic community. Obviously, Detroit's the blackest city in the country, but Southwest is right there, and that's a predominantly uh, Hispanic community. Um, so yeah, I mean, that just happened. DTE uh, had another release as well. They're having issues. Uh, I guess a, a consumer's energy plant that processes fracking gas uh, like had an explosion and a fire and that everybody got the text, right? Y'all got the text? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, take your heat yeah, down. Yeah. Um, and this kind of like highlights if, if, if we are relying upon one company and one type of energy for all of our needs, like how much of a threat are we under if that company goes down? I mean, how many of you know that the fracking gas that we take every year is stored in ground, not in wells, not in pits? Like it, Literally in old coral under Michigan, they pump frack gas into the ground and store it every year and take it out every year. I mean, this is the dumbest shit in the world. Like, it's, it's really silly. I mean, that and it, it, industrial agriculture is also really dumb. I mean, like, people in Lake Erie are having toxic algal blooms that are causing them not to be able to drink water in Toledo. And that's a result of nitrogen leaking from all the farms. Like, and that's, again, industrial agriculture. So it's like... Okay. We have to be like big systems thinking, and we, I don't know how to communicate big systems to people, but that's like probably the most important thing to do. And videos is probably a good way too, because people don't like reading. <laughs> Thank you. We'll take one more. Thanks. Uh, my name is Zach. I'm a student here studying food systems. Uh, this question is probably best for Eric, but if other folks have thoughts, happy to hear it. Um, Going back to the discussion on the de democratization of access for seeds and, and having more diverse seed systems, I'm thinking about the traditional distribution channel in industrial agriculture, and it's very tightly controlled by the big four seed companies and their partners. Um, so with that in mind, like, what is your reaction to companies like Farmers Business Network and Indigo Agriculture that are trying to develop online retail marketplaces, um, sort of disrupt that traditional channel a little bit. And I guess as a follow on to that, what other infrastructure would be needed to really democratize this across the United States? Um, interesting, I, I guess I don't know much about the, the system that you're talking about that's disrupting. Is this an, like an online, tell yeah. me more. Okay, um, so I don't know, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth too much, um, but uh, any system that's not affording the, the attention of the grower to take care of the quality of the seed or the quality of the soil, um, I worry becomes another sort of race to the bottom. Um, it seems like we're always pursuing a more efficient system, and by efficient we mean cheaper, or by efficient we mean less people involved. And um, sort of relating to the climate change question, yeah. um, I think we need to be pursuing a more resilient system. Um, and so I don't know whether this is that or not. Um, but uh, when we commoditize a project, product, and we take a seed and we say, all spinach seed are the same. Search the internet and find the cheapest one. There's always someone that can grow it um, less ethically than you. There's always someone that can treat their, their workers poorer. There's always someone who can treat their soil with less regard. Um, there's always someone that can exploit another uh, aspect of it more. Um, and then the, the market just goes down another notch. 
Um, so that's the real challenge. It's hard to even really put it to words. Um, the real challenge is if, if you're not including more people in farming and agriculture, and um, it's not about seed companies are evil because of all the evil things they do. It's about there's, there's not really a viable way to make a living with, with some heart. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> I mean, we, need, we need more people working in the food system, though, generally. I mean, like I said, 1% of the population is working in agriculture in the United States. Like, the alternative is what, like some service sector job? Like, who wants to do that? Like, I, I don't know. I I'd definitely encourage more people to start growing. And, and, and I think like, if we're doing our own growing, like we're not helping, we're not participating in GDP, but we're also like enriching our lives so much. So I think support like small growers, meet your farmer, get to know the people you buy produce from, build relationships with them. And I think those relationships are gonna like help. I mean, we gotta fight over the farm bill too, but like build a relationship with your farm is a lot easier. Aaron, hey, can you just you remind people again where to buy your seeds? Uh, a2seeds.com, A, the number two, and then seeds. And uh, you can find my, me at the farmer's market, Carytown Market, Saturdays, um, April, May, June. Um, Argus Farm Stop carries them. And community attendees, please return your eye clickers on your way out. You can also pick up a seed catalog from Nature and Nurture. If you didn't...